Yeah, you got to make it a Snapchat show. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to compete with you, though. It's just you're, you're doing it's a really good job we with this thing. We need more uh, content. People are always asking me, like, where's what what additional entrepreneurial right. content is there on Snapchat? So there's a lot of people now, though, right? There's Mark Sister. There's, like, yeah. uh, Gary Vee. There's, like, you know, you're doing a really good thing with those Q&As. And so... I don't know. I kind of feel like you have to find your lane, though. You have to find yeah, your voice exactly. for it, right? It's just uh, it's a bit crowded, right? Uh, I don't think it's that crowded, but you do want to find your own voice, I think. Right. Yeah. But so, like, that's essentially, you know, it's very funny because, you know, when you started doing the live casting thing, right. I mean, that was pretty radical. Now, you know, it's like, okay, we're in 2016. People are like, oh, like, this guy is, like, webcasting his, his life. You'd be like, sure, whatever. Like, my neighbor does that. But yeah. when you started doing that originally, I remember, like, being on the audience side being like, this is kind of crazy and kind of stupid, to be honest. It felt, like, really, really weird, yeah. like a lot of radical ideas do. And then, of course, it turned into, like, Justin TV, like, the service and, like, tons of people signing up for that. And eventually, it seemed like it sort of morphed into Twitch and, of course, like, the huge success that, yeah. it, that it is. And so that was particularly striking to me in, in kind of your background and that, you know, you kind of morphed all of these experiences kind of fairly continuously one into the other. It feels like they organically became the next thing, but maybe that's not true at all. Maybe yeah. it's a bit of a false premise. So what, what was that like, kind of going through all these phases for, for your idea? Well, it was, you know, I think we were kind of stumbling in the dark for a long time uh, trying to make a company. We had this idea that we were going to make a company, and it was our second company, actually. We had been working on uh, Kiko, which is a web calendar that was like Google Calendar, but not as good, and came out, you know, a month before Google Calendar came out. Right. So we decided, hey, let's uh, start another company. Uh, the only idea we had, well, we had a couple ideas, but the idea that Paul Graham was, like, willing to fund was us making our own reality TV show called Justin TV. Nice. He thought that would be just crazy enough it might work. Right. And so we decided to go for it. Didn't know anything about how to create live streams online. In fact, there wasn't really right. much out there. Yeah. Uh, so we had to build all this technology that enabled us to put our own stream up. And then we did that, spent six months doing that, launched our show, and then boom, all right. this press, right. right? A lot of hype because it was this real life Truman Show type thing. Right. And unfortunately, people were all came came to us and said, "Look, your show is really boring. Right. <laughs> like we did this. You'd go out and do something. We're programmers, right? We're sitting there like working on the site, trying to make it like stable. Right. And um, we ended up going to we ended well. We ended up taking that feedback, and luckily they said, "Hey, we also want to create our own live streams." So the light bulb went off, and we pivoted into a right. platform. But that wasn't the original intention. Right. So you weren't thinking like, oh, we'll have this killer app, this killer content of like, you know, me live streaming in my life. And then, you know, that will like encourage others to like also share on the platform. You were just kind of really taking it step by step. And the idea of like opening the platform to others really only came from later. user feedback. It makes sense. And from the feedback of the community of people who stopped on our site right. and checked it out. Right. And it was very general, right? The Justin TV platform, right? You, you seem to welcome right. like a lot of different people doing a lot of different There's things. all sorts of stuff from people streaming their bike races to people making their own like live talk show to people just broadcasting themselves kind of like I was on their daily, doing their daily thing. Right. Almost like Periscope, but before Periscope was, uh, you know, six or seven years before Periscope. And it's interesting because, you know, you could argue that now, like, there's a lot of platforms that serve that kind of live streaming audience, right? Of like, whether that's Snapchat or YouTube, all that stuff. But back then, I remember like it being very, having its own little like, uh, like a little ethos, right? There's just, there was like big content platforms for like, you know, like traditional content and media stuff that wanted to be put online. And there was some experimental stuff on YouTube, but it felt like Justin had its own little kind of um, corner, right? Where if you wanted to share something very, very personal and kind of random and that didn't fit those kind of media stereotypes, like mm -hmm. this was probably the platform for you. Yeah, we had our own, it was the whole set of different video players, right. uh, especially on user generated content right. in 2008, 2009. There was us, Ustream, Livestream, right. uh, companies like VO and Rever, and those all changed. You know, right. it's like not very many of them actually survived. Right. Uh, but we have these different communities. Right. right. A lot of them seem to have gone towards like uh, webinars and stuff like that now yeah. as an audience, or like live streaming concerts, or you know, very corporate-ish type. Those were kind of the things that they could make money off of. Right. And so we grew Justin TV, and it grew and grew and became a pretty big community. Right like 20 to 30 million MAU. And eventually that growth flattened out and we decided we would need to work on some new products in order to you know, have a company that was continuing to grow. 
And so we looked at the content and Emmett, uh, one of my co-founders, really identified gaming as the only content that he liked watching. And it was really a nascent category on the site. So he was like, we should work on this. We were pretty skeptical, to be honest, the rest of us, but we decided to, to take a chance on it, set some goals, and then he started working on that. And uh, it kind of grew and exceeded our expectations until we decided to put more resources on it. Right, and that's an interesting twist, right? Because by, by focusing the platform in a sense, or maybe you disagree, but it, yeah. from the outside, it seemed like by focusing the platform on gaming, you were able to grow past that plateau, right? Grow past that, that MAU number and actually make the platform bigger. Is that correct? That's right. It's, it was very counterintuitive, right? right? Because you would think that gaming was this very small niche. Right. Luckily, we're building into a niche that was growing uh, quite big, and now everyone's talking about esports and uh, esports viewership and people watching games and interacting with people online through games. But that wasn't the case in 2011 when we started working on it. Right. And so, you know, Emmett uh, took a team internally and started working on that, and it grew and grew and grew and it passed our expectations. And in the beginning, we said, in order for this to be uh, important, we're going to want to be as big as GameTrailers.com, which was the biggest right. independent gaming video site. Uh, within two years, and that was I think 10 million at MAU. And then we set goals of like how much we would have to grow to to hit that, mm -hmm. and we exceeded those goals. And I think within six months we we were around 8 million. Right. So is that kind of you know uh, is this kind of a repeating theme I'm hearing a lot of like you have a mix of inspiration of like oh it's going to gaming and like it it feels right. It also maybe doesn't feel right to some people, but you know we're gonna do it. But also this kind of discipline of saying, okay, like we I mean, have an objective. Setting metrics, yeah. yeah. Setting um, metrics a priori was really important for us because we were able to measure our growth against those and say, hey, we're actually doing what we thought we would, right. or like to be successful. We were doing, we're exceeding our expectations right. on what success means. So we, we're mapping out the kind of three really big iterations. I'm sure there were like much smaller kind of smaller iteration or pivots in the middle. Was there a time where you were like really kind of battling your intuition versus like what the metrics were telling you? And you know, I guess how would you recommend people kind of decide whether like it's time to quit and do something else? Well, I think that it's easy to get emotionally caught up in how you feel any given right. day or any given week and think, oh, it's not working. But when it's just, you're growing, it's, it's growing, you're in that first part of an exponential growth curve, right? So it looks like it's linear. It looks right. like it's not growing very well. And so, I've seen that with a lot of friend startups, right? And how part of it is having the discipline to stick to a certain goal and say, if we achieve this goal, you know, then that's it's it's working, and to kind of remove the emotion from the right. choice. I think that uh, for us, we spent a lot of time building products where we didn't measure actually, which was horrible. Uh, and I think that only when we did start talking to our customers and really setting a goal and and um, trying to hit that goal, mm -hmm. did, were we really successful right and so you know it's 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 uh, obviously can be gigantic success right you know in many different ways like twitch uh, esther and you know whether that's kind of from a financial sense with the exit or the number of people that are broadcasting or watching streams or even that cultural impact it has on like, an entire generation to be very honest and it seems like a really really big thing but in, also in some ways it seems smaller than maybe what you were trying to do originally. And, and so I'm wondering, is there some tension in your mind towards that? You know, do you still feel like, hey, you know, it's one way this concept of like, you know, live streaming and live streaming has succeeded, but like there's many other ways we could have succeeded? Or do you look at it and saying like, oh no, that was the way to go and, and I'm glad we found it? Well, I think there are probably many other ways that we could have succeeded, but it it's not smaller than we had thought originally, right? Like, I mean, or uh, as a company in general than, than we would have, Dreamed. It's bigger than we would have ever dreamed of. It, you know, the last one announced numbers were 100 million right. monthly viewers, and we sold it for a billion dollars. Which is, I would say, when we started off, I remember thinking, if we make a company where I can make a million dollars, I would be set. Right. Like that would be like the, the, my wildest dreams. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think we. Uh, <laughs> I'm always like, man, I can't believe that right. Twitch is so big. Right. No, it's definitely affecting a lot. And, you know, it's kind of also a bit of a maybe a two-way relationship, right? We, we, we talked about, like, growing the idea or focusing the idea. But to what extent do you think also, like, society changed during those seven years? And, you know, if you had done video game from the start or, or sooner right, I think than timing did, yeah. mattered. I think we got a lot of entrepreneurship is dedication, being smart about what you're, how you're applying your resources and not giving up, but a lot of it is also luck, right. right? We were lucky that we found a wave that was happening. 
Um, I think the best entrepreneurs capture something that would happen with or without them, right? Yeah, but people, I mean, it, people talk about timing quite a bit, but I'm, you know, I'm wondering if there is something maybe a bit more uh, intricate about it. You know, to what extent do you feel like Twitch made this kind of move towards um, watching game broadcast and esports and all that happen versus benefited from it happening, you know, at the oh, right time? I think time. it's both, right? right? Probably grew the audience of people who are interested in this content and build our own community where there's things happening that are, um, I'd say that we built, there, Twitch is a community where that generates content now. Like Twitch Plays Pokemon was really popular in 2014 where right. the community was controlling this Pokemon right. stream, right? And that's not content that would have existed without Twitch. But at the same time, there was all these e people interested in building esports, esports communities. Uh, the gaming companies realized that competitive gameplay was a great driver right. for their games. And so there were, you know, without the game companies making these uh, competitive modes, right. this would never have taken off. Right. And so it's a bit more than just kind of being in the right place in the right time, right? You can also make your luck to some extent or help shape the community, help shape the movement, right? That, that benefits you. I think it's both, right? right? You need both. Right. So that, that kind of, you know, um, lines up, you know, historically in, in terms of those, those different phases. So what are some of the stuff that you feel like from um, a live streaming and live streaming, like live video is obviously like a huge thing right now, you know, between... Facebook, of course, pushing it a lot, and YouTube, you know, out now finally kind of letting everybody kind of broadcast live and all that stuff. So, what do you think are some of the next big kind of frontiers in, in terms of like live streaming and live streaming? What are some of the stuff that that you feel like you wish you had as a, as a user or you you would do today if you weren't busy with some other projects? Well, I think with live video, I think vi video in general, the way to compete against Facebook or YouTube, which are massive platforms with you know over a billion right. uh, billion a MAU, right? Like. And uh, I think the way to compete with them is really to build a video, like something that's a, a community-focused product right. that focuses on a specific community. That's right. what Twitch did, right? Uh, Twitch was better than is better than YouTube Gaming or YouTube Live because right. it focuses really on ga you know gamers and a Twitch community, mm -hmm. and there's this network effect there where people have started to identify Twitch as the place to go for gaming content, right. and that was. I would say a process to build up. It wasn't like an overnight thing. It was right. a lot of focus on on building, a, you know, on having a community development team right. that went out and like you know talked to the community. We're from the community. Right. It was supporting people in the community before it, made, it was like you know very clearly the best economical decision. Uh, so I think that there's that's a way that you can compete with the generalized platforms. And, and it shows into a lot of different things, you know, I, I, to kind of maybe give people more examples, like just very basic things like the way comments work or, um, or even just the tone of the comments and the tone of yeah. interaction language that's developed on the platform. I think, you know, the users really recognize that and that's why people would rather kind of do yeah. uh, gaming streaming on, on Twitch rather than somewhere else, right? So that, that kind of community focus, and it can take many, many different shapes from Sure, like high level marketing and branding, but also like just the way your features work or the way the community itself reacts. Exactly. Yeah, I think you now is another great example, right? You now is being successful with mobile uh, streaming and they focus, I think, on a lot more on the social broadcasters. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more verticals where someone can create a verticalized video site, whether it's around fitness or beauty. Uh, and, and or e-commerce, right? And, and um, build something that appeals like very strongly to a smaller group of people. And then the community kind of grows from there. The ironic thing with Twitch is that now that it has this big base of you know, viewers, we're, uh, the, the Twitch team has put things that were originally on Justin TV back on, right? right. Like music uh, or creative, like people creating art. Right, or it's, eating, yeah, I was, I was checking eating, that. Yeah, yeah social yeah, eating. Yeah. So I think that the, uh, like focusing on a community and then building that really tight community and then going broader is, is kind of the way right. that you can compete. It seems like, you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's a typical thing in like multi-sided market or the platform strategy stuff where you, you kind of zigzag your way, you kind of build your audience one side and then you use that to kind of get another audience. And the typical example is, uh, you know, it's like a nightclub where you do ladies night and then ladies get in for free and then that way you get the guys, <laughs> right? So that's a very, you know, maybe antiquated example at this point. But, um, you know, this is kind of what you're saying in a sense of like, okay, you can focus on maybe gamers or some other niche, really kind of grow a lot and get a lot of MAUs that way and then kind of move on to the next step and kind of keep growing your platform that way, the same way that maybe 
Facebook did that by doing colleges and then kind of growing into into a bigger landscape. But it's not necessarily the shortest path to go directly for the large audience and the general public. Right. Yeah, that seems to make a lot of sense. Exactly. So yeah, like a lot of good stuff there in terms of like you know when to grow and when to focus. Right. right. When to go for a bigger target versus when to narrow down your idea and and uh, that helps a lot. So yeah, do you have any? kind of just general uh, advice on that, on when to grow and when to focus, it seems like that's a typical struggle. Well, I think you always want to be talking to your customer, right? right. That's what we talk about at YC all the time. Right. Uh, you want to talk to your customer. That Really, the way Twitch grew was that Emmett went out and talked to the gamers in the very, it like, and said, what would it take to get you to broadcast on our site if you're not already, or broadcast more? Right. And got their feedback, and, and a lot of things that we had thought about at Justin TV but never implemented, uh, we ended up implementing because of the feedback, right? right? Those were things were like helping people get paid right. uh, because they wanted to do this full time as their job right. or increasing the quality of our streams. We thought our solution was good enough, but actually the quality wasn't really good enough for gaming. Right. And so you never really know what to focus on unless you're talking to your customers, right? And observing and looking at the data, the qualitative data, and the quantitative data, right? right. Um, you know, you, you don't know. Like some of the, some of the times, it might be the right thing to to uh, work on increasing your quality of service because if you uh, add additional customers, they're just going to churn, right? right, right. Uh, or your quality of service might be good enough. Customers might be like slightly, dis, you know, there might be they they could be more satisfied, but they're satisfied enough. So you should be focusing on on growth. Right. I think that. You don't know, and it's different for every company. But the right, way you, right. that you get there is by really being in that feedback cycle right. of of talking to customers. Right. So again, yeah, there's no silver bullets, but yeah, that's kind of good advice, right? Yeah. You know, it's like um, you you know use the feedback loop and use the metrics, right, to guide whether or not you're you're going in the right direction with your ideas. So cool, that helps a lot. Awesome, I think that's it. Cool. We're keeping those pretty simple which, and short, yeah. and then you know, because you know, exactly. it's like online content. Web video, online <laughs> content. People can only put ten seconds at a time. Yeah. So one of the big insights that we found in our journey is defining diversity. Um, it ends up being something where you have to talk about difference. You have to be able to have language and toolkits to talk about what makes people different from another, how you define strengths and weaknesses, um, how you actually align resources towards work to be done. Um, and it's, it's really something where I think the conversation about right. diversity, it almost like gets in the way sometimes of actually talking about the differences between people.